Hello, you boy in the corner there. You ought to be a boy scout. You're a fine-looking fella, and I know you'd make a jolly good backwoodsman by the look of you. You're ugly enough anyway. Last summer's Scout Jamboree in Holland, bringing together young people from 167 countries, was the legacy of one man. Baden Powell has claimed a new follower every five seconds for the past 90 years. Apart from the great religions and political ideologies, scouting is the largest movement in the history of the world. Robert Baden Powell is one of the most famous and influential Englishmen of the century. If only he'd had the gift of eternal youth, Baden Powell would never have needed to invent the Boy Scouts. Entranced by J.M. Barry's Peter Pan, he saw it three times in its opening week. His only son, Peter, was named after it. Scouting would become Baden Powell's way of retreating back into the world of boyhood. The really essential meaning of scouting to Baden Powell, it was above all things an escape. Baden Powell sometimes talked about himself as, as being a boy man, and he, he suggested to scoutmasters that they'd understand boys much better if they could relearn boyhood and become boy men. In fact, Stevie, as Baden Powell was known for much of his life, never did have a happy childhood. When he was three, his father, a clergyman and Oxford professor, died of pneumonia. His mother, Henrietta Grace, was a domineering woman with an extravagant lifestyle. Her principal aim for the children was that... They should be pleased to do my will. She was a martinet. She was a very commanding woman. If one sees pictures of her, she is red-haired, she's big, she's buxom, and she was determined that her children would be very great within the British Empire. At school, he was already disappointing his mother. As a pupil at Charter House in the 1870s, his academic record was lamentable. In his day, it was unfashionable for boys to work hard, and he was evidently a slave to fashion. A good comic actor and very gifted artist, he always preferred drawing to learning. Not surprisingly, he failed to get to Oxford, where his father and two elder brothers had been. Another disappointment for mother. Full of misgivings, he joined the Hussars, coming a shining second out of 700 applicants. But a military career wasn't his own choice. He wanted to be an artist or actor, but mother had insisted on the cavalry. His first posting was to Lucknow in India. He was deeply unhappy there. Though a grand city of the Raj, Lucknow was unbearably hot rife with cholera and typhoid. After 20 years in the Hazars, and with constant prodding from his mother, Baden Powell had risen steadily to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He'd become an expert in military scouting, developing new ideas on tracking, reconnaissance and camouflage. 
he wrote numerous books, which he rightly saw as a way of furthering his career. On completing Reconnaissance and Scouting, he wrote to his brother George, It'll be a grand advertisement for me, as I'm sending it to Wolseley and the other bosses, to ask if they approve it. Field Marshal Lord Wolseley did approve, and Baden-Powell's efforts to cultivate his patronage eventually paid off. In 1899, a chance encounter with Wolseley at his London club was to change his life and fortune. He told me, I want you to go to South Africa. A year later, he would return from his mission, the most famous man in England. Baden Powell first became a household name after his legendary exploits in South Africa during the Boer War. His task was to divert as many enemy troops as possible away from the front line. He occupied the town of Mafeking and invited the Boers to attack. To that extent, the famous siege was self-imposed. Mafeking stands on the railway that Cecil Rhodes built a century ago, linking South Africa to Rhodesia. It was a vital supply line for the British forces. Surrounded by flat, dusty felt, it was not an easy place to defend. Baden-Powell ordered the land around the town to be cleared of scrub, so the enemy couldn't creep up unseen. Fortified trenches were built on the only vantage point in the area. He also indulged in boyish tricks to hoodwink the enemy. Baden-Powell employed many clever tactics to fool his enemy. One in particular was the minefield, the fake minefield. The felt all around the town had little mines planted here and there, which were virtually boxes of sand, wires running back. Uh, one mine was a real one, had dynamite, um, and he exploded this as a demonstration of mines being tested. Uh, I, I think that kept the Boers guessing for a few days at least. In addition to that, imaginary barbed wire was strung out on poles, uh, and soldiers were seen to be stepping over this imaginary barbed wire giving the impression, of course, that the town was uh, more securely defended than it really was. Baden-Powell's force of 900 men was outnumbered seven to one by the Boers. To help his cause, he organized a cadet corps from among the young white boys in the town. They were his lookouts and messenger boys. He later styled them the first Boy Scouts. Several were killed by shrapnel during the siege. Seven months of bombardment, disease and combat claimed the lives of almost 200 of the 2,000 whites in Mafeking. But Baden-Powell's resolve never wavered. Throughout the siege, he led by example. A fellow officer noted his composure. A shell whistled overhead. I hoped the colonel would take cover, but he didn't. A second shell sang a little nearer. He rose, whistling to himself, and as a third shell wrecked a couple of nearby buildings, he said, you had better come inside. For seven months, Baden-Powell succeeded in maintaining morale in the town by becoming the actor impresario that he had always longed to be. He opened a theater and often played the leading role himself. There were even Jim Carners, made possible by the Boers' refusal to fight on Sundays. The British press, with no other good news to report from the war, contained daily dispatches from Mafeking. And when, after 217 days, the siege that Baden-Powell had created was finally broken. The British public took to the streets. It was absolutely sensational, and the country went mad. For four days, nobody worked. They had parties in the streets. The country just went absolutely bananas. And, of course, Baden Powell was the hero of the hour and he reached a fame that probably only the monarch enjoys in this country 
everybody in the country knew about him. Kaiser Wilhelm's Germany, the youngest and strongest of Europe's empires, was seen as the likely aggressor who would bring war to Europe. And in war, only the fittest would survive. Could scouting save the nation? Baden-Powell thought so. In an article for the Eton School magazine, he wrote, We are a small country, surrounded by nations who may at any time attempt to crush us. One great thing each boy can do for his country is to get together a squad of, say, ten boys from his town or village and teach them how to shoot, how to scout, and how to drill. Just as the Eton College article begins with the notion of uh, people of uh, England being surrounded by enemies, so um, the Boy Scout uh, handbook begins with a discussion of Mefeking, which was surrounded by enemies. And it's quite clear that Baden-Powell sees the metaphor of Mefeking as an indication of what England faces, that England is surrounded and is vulnerable, and the way to deal with that is to train lower-class youth to be prepared to fight for the empire. Uh, a dull lad who can obey orders, he says, is better than a bright one who can't. What one has to remember is that baden Powell was a soldier all his working life, and so of course he wanted boys to defend Britain and the empire if it was attacked. That was very, very important to him. But it didn't come first in his thinking about the Boy Scouts. It was his desire to make boys into better citizens that was his greatest interest. In 1907, Baden-Powell, now aged 50, organized his first camping expedition to test his ideas on scouting. In May, he sailed to Brown Sea Island off the Dorset coast. With him were boys from Harrow, Eton and Charterhouse, together with local lads from the Bournemouth Boys Brigade. It was a daring social mix for Edwardian England. <laughs> Equally novel was Baden Powell's instruction to the Brown Sea boys to wear short trousers, at that time almost unknown in Britain. The boys would learn woodcraft and tracking, but Baden Powell also aimed to teach them discipline, as he explained in a letter from the island. There will be instruction in life saving technique and physical exercises, and drill. One wants to teach the boys the quality of not grousing, and I think that may come as a result of training like that of scouts, for they are not born grousing. There is hope if one catches them young enough. But he did have a genuine you know, love of all boys, and he was particularly keen on the idea of, of camping being something that would be helpful for boys who were brought up in inner cities, that they should get away to the freedom of, of, of the countryside and escape their everyday lives. On his return from Brownsea, Baden-Powell wrote Scouting for Boys. Published in six parts, it was an instant success. In four months, a hundred thousand copies were sold. It would go on to outsell all printed books apart from the Bible, the Quran, and the thoughts of Chairman Mao. Baden-Powell could have made his fortune from it, but instead donated all the profits to the Scouts. Today, the Boy Scout Manual is the handbook for democratic youth the world over. More than 10 million copies have already been sold. It is a guide for the Boy Scout who, one night each week, assembles with his troop to reaffirm his own oath and to administer it to any new member. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the Scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Scouting owes its appeal to Baden-Powell's knack for being all things to all men. Back in 1908, the establishment applauded its military bias. The church approved of its good deeds. And Edwardian boys found the packaging irresistible. By 1911, Baden-Powell was father to a movement of a quarter of a million boys and girls. But he had no children of his own, and his mother was pestering him to get married. Mm -hmm. 
Sailing to America on scout business that summer, he met Olive Soames. He was 55, she 23. Strong, energetic, and with a love of the outdoors, she was an ideal match for Baden-Powell. They were married the following year. Baden-Powell did love his wife and succeeded in fathering three children. When the Great War broke out, the scouts were prepared. They tilled the fields, took on coast-watching duties, and even emptied the rubbish. As recreation for the troops, scout huts were set up in France. Baden-Powell spent several months there. But the carnage he now witnessed dulled any enthusiasm he'd once had for the glory of battle. He particularly deplored, you know, the death of a young men whom he adored. And after the war, he took any kind of militarism right out of the movement. He was determined that it should be essentially a peace movement dedicated to the ideals of international peace through young people meeting each other. The pursuit of international peace meant spreading the scout gospel beyond the world of the white man. 11,000 scouts in this jamboree camp will be reviewed by the chief. By 1931, there were three million boy scouts, to whom Baden-Powell, now dubbed chief scout of the world, was a superstar. Let us then, with pride, repeat the scout promise. On my honor, I promise I will do my best to do my duty to God and the King. By the time war broke out, the aging boy man had left Pax Hill to settle in Kenya. He was now in his 80s. To the end, he retained the power to captivate children. When I was about three years old, uh, my family went up to Kenya to stay with him. Now, as a child, I was very curious, and I always wanted to know answers to my questions, and nobody would ever give them. But for the first time in my life, I met somebody who would not only answer the questions, but expand on it, so that it really gave me an overall picture. And, of course, that was the old man. And because of that, I absolutely adored him. It was in the Africa that he knew and loved so well that Lord Baden-Powell was laid to rest. Near his home at Nayeri in Kenya, the coffin was borne with full honours to the cemetery and final tributes were paid to that great man, the Chief Scout. As a soldier, his fame was great. And as the founder of the finest youth movement ever organized, he will be remembered by generations to come. It's interesting how he did channel two important aspects of himself into the Boy Scouts. He allowed boys of all sorts of, of uh, backgrounds and, and uh, economic difficulties and things to, to have a, a good life. The second thing I think he, he channeled into the Scouts was his Peter Pan complex. He was absolutely preoccupied with being a child and never growing up. And I think that by concentrating on, on boys, he in some way allowed his own identification with them to remain permanent. He was always a small boy indulging in small boys' games. Yeah. 